So good morning everyone and happy Red Squirrel Awareness Week 2022. We hope you're getting involved in some way, whether it be reporting sightings of red and grey squirrels to support conservation, actively engaging and or supporting other conservation efforts, finding out more about our endangered red squirrels or helping raise awareness through posting or sharing communications. It all helps to make a difference in saving these beautiful mammals for current and future generations. Uh, thank you for joining us for this UK Squirrel Accord webinar, which is part of a wider online conference for Red Squirrel Awareness Week. Apologies for there being no speakers this afternoon, but unfortunately a couple of people had to drop out at the last minute due to unforeseen circumstances. Tomorrow morning, there's a UK Squirrel Accord update on activities and achievements and how the UK Squirrel Accord works with myself. And in the afternoon, Judy Dunn from the Wildwood Trust looks at red squirrel breeding. Go to www.squirrelaccord.uk forward slash events for more details and to register. And if you've already registered, then you can use the same link for every session. This morning, we have our third annual Red Squirrel Conservation Update from across the UK countries. We'll hear from Katie Bell from Royal Islands Ulster Wildlife Trust, Rebecca Clues Roberts from Welsh Government, Nicole Still from Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels, and Stephen Trotter from England's Cumbria Wildlife Trust. There'll be a recording of this made available on the UK Squirrel Record YouTube channel, and recordings of the previous two UK updates can also be found there, along with many other useful videos. After the presentations, we'll have a Q&A session. So if you have any questions you'd like to pose our speakers, then please use Zoom's Q&A function. This will allow me to collate them more easily for the live Q&A session. Uh, and please feel free to use the chat function for any hellos and general conversation. Brilliant. Well, we hope you enjoy this update. And I will now hand over to Katie to start us off in Northern Ireland. Thanks. Morning, everyone. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen here. You've got me first this morning. Let's see. Can everyone see that okay? Yeah. That's yeah, right. that's okay. great. Thanks. Perfect. Okay, good morning. So, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Katie Bell. I work as Senior Conservation Officer for Ulster Wildlife. So Ulster Wildlife is the Wildlife Trust that covers the whole of Northern Ireland. And I have the pleasure of managing a number of our terrestrial species projects. And one of those is Red Squirrel. So just in case you kind of don't know what we do, a quick slide about Ulster Wildlife. So um, we protect a variety of habitats. We have 19 nature reserves now across the whole of Northern Ireland. We try and bring people closer to nature through um, a whole number of projects and we also save wildlife so we work on both terrestrial and marine wildlife in Northern Ireland. So today I want to talk to you about squirrels and what's been going on in Northern Ireland in the last year. So one of our major achievements is getting the red squirrel strategy for Northern Ireland out there. So this has been a kind of a big piece of work and it is so great to have it published and out there. Um, it's a 10 year strategy. So it's really looking at, you know, long term conservation of red squirrels locally. Um, we have it on the website. If anyone hasn't read it, wants to read it, um, go ahead. It's a great, great piece of work if you do say so myself. And um, we collaborate with lots of people. So it's really nice to have the input from everyone kind of from cross border. So from the UK Squirrel Accord and also on an all Ireland basis as well. So basically we kind of are looking at, we want to maintain the po populations of red squirrels across the country. We also want to support recovery in places where they used to be. We need to get um, remove red squirrels in certain areas and this is both by human control and the support of pine martin recovery, that's really key here, and also habitat management. So um, four kind of big aims and how do we really achieve those? So, a number of a number of kind of actions we've got in here there's a lot more detail in the strategy but um you know gray squirrel management is really important as we say that's through control and pine martin recovery so supporting pine martin recovery is um a big part of our work as well public support and awareness is so important and red squirrel awareness week is great for that we continue to monitor i'm going to talk about that in a minute um, supporting research, disease monitoring, um, nature recovery networks is really important, and also um, captive breeding releases and translocations. So we are partnering with Belfast Zoo and the Environment Agency on a number of these. We're actually in the middle of one at the minute. Hopefully you'll find out about that soon. So we also wanted to look at um, kind of priorities. So this, this map um, is kind of 
a bit fluid. This was kind of what we thought at the time, but this can change over time when we find out more from our monitoring. So really, we, we wanted to look at um, areas that really, really need to be protected as red squirrel strongholds and areas that could be strongholds in the future. But also one of the most important things is looking at our grey squirrel control zones. So there's a couple of priorities here. So the first priority is basically areas that need controlled now because we've got these small fragmented populations of red squirrels and those those populations need protected now. And then the second ones are our big source population and they kind of need um, you know, something more systematic and a big a bigger a bigger project, which is where maybe the contraceptive could come in in the future. But this is our big kind of urban populations of grey squirrels. So this year we've been surveying. This is a survey year for us. We have been monitoring red squirrels across Northern Ireland since 2014. And we do this every other year now. So the last time we surveyed was 2020. So this has been a huge big survey year for us. We had a target of 150 woodlands across Northern Ireland um, and we've just looked at it this week and realised we've hit 155. So that is just amazing. We're, we're really pleased with that. We are then going to work at filling in the gaps over the winter. So we're hoping to hit 200, um, but we'll see, see how much we can get out. So basically we are recording red squirrel, grey squirrel and pie marten. And this involves putting up a camera trap and a feeder, like you can see here, and leaving them for two weeks. So this is just so important. Um, it's a big, uh, you know, it's a big strategic goal of ours to keep monitoring. We don't just do it because um, it's interesting. You know, it is, it is really vitally important. It's important for us to target our conservation because we need to know, you know, have red squirrels recovered in an area? Are they moving out? or have grey squirrels popped up somewhere we didn't know before and, and how do we go about you know dealing with that so this just is so important and it's also great to have this long data set um, and to see the change over time so it really is good to inform conservation and so my colleague girl site doing some surveying there so what have we been finding? Um, we don't have the final results because we're not quite finished yet, um, but we've been getting a lot, um, lots of nice pictures on the camera and lots of things. So um, of course we've been getting greys. Now um, it's interesting that these are actually our least recorded species out of the three. Now we have been surveying in less urban areas, so that's probably why. But this is really, really nice to see that actually we aren't picking up as many greys um, as we used to. Getting lots of, of these lovely abellas. I love this pose here, posing for the camera. Um, lovely to see all the colour differences as well, something we find really interesting in all the images. This one's got a really, really dark black tail. We've had ones with nice wee blonde tails and, and lots of black on the body. So it's nice seeing the different colours. But we've had lots of red squirrels turn up. And of course, um, the pine marten. So the pine marten has just spread hugely in Northern Ireland and they are popping up all over the place now. So, so far actually from the 155 sites, red squirrel is our most numerous species recorded, which is amazing. Pine marten is there just behind. So we basically have picked up red squirrel in 52 woodlands in Northern Ireland, which is just wonderful. Um, and pine marten in 51. And I think grey squirrel in 31, 32 woodlands um, so far. So yeah, that's really, really interesting. Now this, um, I'm going to show you a bit of a map. This is for something we did this year to show all the effort. Um, I just said to not share it on Twitter because it's not finished yet. Um, but um, we're really, really happy with this. This just is amazing to show like the survey effort that has gone on this year. So each of these logos shows you kind of who did the survey. So this shows you um, a great kind of mix from us. So we, we've done a lot over the country, but also the volunteer Red Squirrel groups. They have done so much for us along with the National Trust. Um, so yeah, it's really great to see everyone kind of surveying their patch. If you don't see your square up here and you've surveyed, it's because you haven't sent us the data. So please send us the data. We really want to um, get more of these 10 kilometer squares filled. And also this shows us what we kind of have to 
due in November. So we've been leaving it for a little bit because there's lots of natural food out and the squirrels aren't really coming to feeders and cameras. So we'll be picking it up again next month and trying to fill in as many gaps as possible. But it's just great to see this huge big team effort going on across Northern Ireland. So what did we find before? So these were the results going up to 2020. So once we have the 2022 data, we'll be able to add this and we'll have a bigger and better picture of what's going on. But this was just an idea. So red, gray and pine martin of what we were finding. So you can see um, the kind of reds are a lot of a lot of them in the west and kind of around the edge. Grey is kind of concentrated more in the east uh, and a bit more scattered. And then Pine Martins in quite a lot of the places. Um, so a few interesting things we have been finding. Um, if you take a look at Fermanagh, you can actually see Fermanagh is grey squirrel free. And this is still the case in 2022. This is still what we're finding. Um, we have a local group there that are on the case um, if, if a grey squirrel does come into the county. But at the minute, it, it's technically grey squirrel free, which is just amazing. Um, and one of the main reasons for that really is pine martin recovery in, in the West. And there's a really healthy population of pine martins alongside the red squirrels there. And you can just see the difference here. This is um, showing you the 2019 map and just the massive change that we've had um, in Pine Martin spread across Ireland. So again, if you look at Fermanagh, you can see a real, real healthy, dense population of Pine Martins and Red Squirrels, both in the same county. And we did look in, in 2020, we want to look at this again, but we were interested to see how many squares had Pine Martin and Red Squirrels and how many had Pine Martin and Grey Squirrels. So you can see here, these are the number of squares that had both Pine Martin and Red, um, which was which is interesting. So quite a lot of places these two coexist in. They're both native mammals. They can both coexist beside each other, no problem. Um, and this just shows you there is we had Pine Martin and Grey, so hardly anywhere. And this is similar in 2022. We don't have them up yet, but it is similar. Um, you know, the pro one of the problems is, um, when we have these small isolated populations of red squirrel that pine martins can have an impact on them which is why we basically need to continue to support the recovery of red squirrel and allow this connectivity so we don't have all these little isolated populations so this is a map of all our red squirrel groups this is just uh, amazing to see there are so many um, across the country and thank you to all of them for everything they do so they really champion and support red squirrel conservation in their local patch. We can do most of the work that we do without these guys. They do a lot of the on the ground work. So the groups vary from, you know, a lot of them will do awareness raising. Some of them grey squirrel control. It, it kind of varies in the area and on the local populations. But um, one of the most important things is that they monitor and they look for changes um, and that's just really really important so this year um COVID hasn't totally gone away but it's been a big change from the last two we were able to get out again and go and see these groups and work on the ground with them and this was great so it was just so lovely to get back to giving talks and going and visiting sites and trying to help the groups expand the range or um whatever they needed from us basically so yeah this was really lovely to get out again into the world um, we are continuing our lantra training so we are funded through the Environment Agency to run four Lantra courses a year. This is really great because it means the participant doesn't have to pay for it, um, which, which is really um, invaluable, really, you know, for people. Um, so we normally do four a year. We've done two so far in this calendar year in this autumn. So that's great. We've had 10 people through the course. And we have a waiting list. We always have a waiting list of people wanting the course. So we'll be doing two more before, before the end of March. And this consists of a theory and a practical. And it's just great getting people in the room again. And because you have great discussions and people can ask questions and things. Um, and yeah, it's been really, really useful. We, um, we find it helps as well, you know, 
we encourage everyone to go through this and especially when we're working with the likes of councils and they're worrying about people coming in to undertake grey squirrel control we make sure we say look everyone is under accredited um, and yeah we believe we believe that's really important um, and lastly, I won't keep you too long, um, we have launched our new sightings database yesterday. So this has been a long time coming. This is something we've been working on over the last year and um, it's out in the world. So you can see it on our website. And um, we initially kind of got this idea from um, Red Squirrels Northern England. And we did this piece of work kind of over the winter and through this year. This is basically a uh, a way for people to record these three species when they're kind of out and about so they can go um from their phone and record it there or record it when they get home basically then creates this live map and we can kind of filter that by year this is just going to be so valuable now we are partnered with cedar cedar is the the data recording um um center in northern ireland and all these records will go to them um, but this way um, we can kind of see it in real time instead of kind of asking them for it every year. It means if a record comes in and we see, oh, flip, there's a grey records come in there, we, we need to go and tell the group or we'll be able to kind of track expansion of, of, the red, of reds outside survey season and things like that. So this is really um, invaluable. We'll also have another version added to this and um, where the groups can go in and put their own kind of data in on grey scroll control effort and everything and it means they will be able to produce their kind of own maps and things which will help with their funding and everything and show the kind of effort that they've been going to every year so this is great so we're encouraging anyone in northern ireland to please um please add your sightings and um, these these will be verified as well um, but yeah, please add them because it's really great. We've had have quite a few coming in already, which is just so nice to see because this has been um, a big piece of work. So it's lovely that that is out and um, um, yeah, it's going to be really, really useful. So just lastly, from this little squirrel, please add your sightings to our database. And um, if anyone wants to get in touch, my email and my colleague Ross's is there um, if anyone has any questions for us after this. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Katie. Great news for Red Squirrel Recovery in Northern Ireland. Um, and yeah, please, everyone in Northern Ireland, please get involved. Or if you're visiting Northern Ireland, do get involved. That's fantastic. Um, and now we'll pass over to Rebecca Clues-Roberts for a Wales-focused update. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, fantastic update there from Northern Ireland. So um, my name is Becky Clues Roberts, and I work for Natural Resources Wales, actually, which uh, so not Welsh government, but Natural Resources Wales. Um, so we oversee the um, the red squirrel focal sites in Wales, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so as part of the Welsh Government Red Squirrel Conservation Plan, which was written in 2009 and updated in 2018, um, they identified three focal sites within Wales, which are highlighted here. So up on the, uh, the northwest there, we've got Anglesey and Gwynedd coming off onto the mainland. In the north, uh, sorry, the northwest and the northeast, we've got Clackinog Forest. And in Mid Wales, which focuses mainly around the Towie Forest. Uh, and the way that it's set up here in Wales, as I said, Natural Resources Wales manage a lot of these uh, Welsh Government woodland estates where the, the red where the red squirrels occur, and we work with um, red squirrel groups accordingly. So to just give you an update um, that I received from across the, the, the three groups. Firstly, over in Clackinog Forest, uh, the group over there are called Clackinog Red Squirrels Trust or CRST for short. And um, their update is that they're continuing to monitor the red squirrel activity across the forest via trail cameras. Uh, so they've, they've got a team of volunteers who go out weekly, in fact, and they've got various um, different sections across the forest where they've got trail cameras. Uh, I think they've got about 70 or so out there at the moment, so they visit all of those in, in, um, in order. 
and uh, report back with their sightings and that would include any grey squirrels that, that crop up uh, and of course yes they work with the local Natural Resources Wales team uh, re regarding forest operations. Recently um, Sarah Beetham from AFA, um, Animal Plants Health Agency, um, she attended Kynog Forest with CRST and um, she's um, loaned them uh, some remote frequency ID readers. So some of the squirrels in Klakinog Forest uh, are chipped because this, these were from um, releases from over the years. And these RFIDs, as they're called, they will actually read uh, the chip that is in the back of the squirrel's neck. Um, and we're able to identify indiv those individuals who, that are chipped. So uh, they've been placed, I think it was a couple of weeks ago or so, so we've yet to have any feedback on that, but um, hopefully those are, those are working um, and we'll get some useful, useful data and to just double check that uh, those squirrels that we released over the years are, are still around. Uh, she also brought up um, some extra trail cameras that were spare after some of the, the monitoring that she'd been carrying out elsewhere. Uh, and hopefully um, they're going to be using that to, to look at red squirrel density uh, by using trail cameras. Sorry, um, Rebecca, so be, uh, your main yeah. slide still showing is the front slide. There's the initial slide. You might have to manually click on the slides to, yeah, that's it. Yeah, thanks. Right. Okay. My <laughs> view is very different. Sorry, um, I don't know. I don't understand what's going on here. No. It's so yes. Yeah, so did thanks. you get this? These were the focal sites. Thank you. Okay. So we've got Anglesey over in the northwest and Clackinog in the northeast and Mid Wales over here. So this was the update for Clackinog Forest. Sorry. Um, so we've got, yeah, this was the image of Sarah with the CRST members installing some of those remote frequency ID readers. Um, so, yeah, so that was the update uh, for that. And then Klakinog also, they're working uh, with Chester University, learning from some the, the expertise from some of the, um, the, the lecturers there on uh, uh, animals in their habitat. So hopefully that will uh, help um, sort of educate and bring CRST up to speed with, with some of the, the science behind it. And of course, they're also, as a, a group, they're recruiting volunteers to help their cause. Um, mostly the roles will be looking for feeding signs such as this on the tree stump uh, and also looking at those um, uh, tra trail cameras and the remote frequency ID readers as well. Mid Wales Red Squirrel Partnership. So I heard from um, Sarah Purden, who is the Red Squirrel Officer. So the Mid Wales Red Squirrel Partnership um, is run by the Wildlife Trust of South and West Wales um, and has been for a number of years now. Uh, they've had uh, they had some funding to carry out some DNA um, analysis. Uh, the project is still continuing. They have unfortunately reported some some low catch rates of red squirrels. So the sample size is about twenty. Um, so they're going to be looking at adjusting techniques to see if they can catch uh, any more. And they're working with Swansea University on that, uh, who are. Um, um, analyzing the DNA, but uh, they're also having a few few difficulties. Um, so at the moment, they haven't got any major results to confirm, um, but apart from that, uh, they, they're still picking up this unique mid Wales haplotype within the population, uh, which is very interesting. And uh, they're going to continue to trap uh, the squirrels to hope to get some, some uh, more data and more results soon. Um, so they're, they're also suggesting that they've, they're seeing fewer reds on their long term camera monitoring locations. Um, so they're looking at uh, purchasing some more cameras so that they can spread spread the cameras around a bit. Um, may, maybe got some concerns populations declined this year, but early, early days yet. It may well be that some of the, the forestry works that have had to take place um, due to um, phytophthora and diseased trees may have moved the, the squirrels on to somewhere else. So, um, so that's that's something they'll be continuing to monitor. And their current project, the Healthy Reds project, um, that's ending this autumn. So they're actually seeking funding to help them um, continue past spring 2023. 
Okay, so the other um, group, the Red Squirrels Trust Wales on uh, so Gwynedd and Anglesey, um, so that's RSTW. So their main uh, update at the moment is working on the Magical Mammals Project, which is a partnership project. So they're the lead partner, and this is um, natural. Uh, this is a Heritage Lottery Fund money. Uh, but they're working with CRST, the Kokinog, and with support from NRW. It's a five-year project um, for uh, 4,095,000, uh, 4, sorry, 495,000 pounds to boost red squirrel and pine martin numbers across Gwynedd, Anglesey, and Kokinog Forest. So it's fantastic to get that money. And the main, uh, what they're working on at the moment is starting to recruit. They've got the recruitment drive to start filling the posts in for that project, which is fantastic. Um, so yes, as it suggests here, that they'll be enabling project staff. So there'll be a part-time officer for Kokinog carrying out uh, grey control, but also red school reinforcement and so on. And then final slide, just a bit of an update from the overall, the overarching, uh, the, the Woodland Estate, the Welsh Government Woodland Estate. So there's been some in internal guidance recently published uh, for, for staff to use, which was sort of consolidation of a lot of information uh, for them to use in one place and looking at a sort of consistent and standard approach uh, for Red Squirrel on the Forest Estate. Um, also looking at developing a toolbox talk for operational contractors who might be operating within a red squirrel forest, making sure that they adhere to um, the, the correct uh, mitigation. Um, also looking at a study on the approach to a sort of monitoring um, coning within a forest and what that might mean. So looking at the different years um, of, of coning and enabling sort of forest estate management to, um, to, to carry out their works uh, within the sort of the coning, the coning year. Um, we've also been looking at using uh, the use of drones uh, to detect heat sources, which may help inform forestry um, operations, but it's early stages on that at the moment. And also um, over in the, the, the North West on Anglesey, NRW recently commissioned a report for using trail cameras to determine red squirrel density. Um, so the draft is just currently being approved of that report, uh, which was called using remote activated cameras to estimate relative abundance and habitat preference of red squirrels. Okay, thank you. Sorry about the technical problems, but I think uh, we, we got the message over. Thank you. Thanks very much, Becky. Uh, yeah, apologies for the technical and also for the chat function. For some reason, it had been turned off for people being able to use it. I've, I've changed the settings now. They do, it doesn't usually come up like that, but um, it should be working now. But fun, fantastic work going on in Wales as well. Thank you. Um, and now we'll pass over to Nicole uh, to have a look at Scotland. Thanks, Nicole. Hopefully everything will work. <laughs> I think your microphone's still off, Nicole, sorry. Right, hopefully we're seeing the right form of the presentation. Yeah, now. yeah, it looks great, thank you. <laughs> great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Nicole Still. I'm the new program manager for Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels. Um, and I'll hopefully give you a whistle-stop tour of what's going on up north today. Um, okay. Here we go. Uh, so for those of you that may or may not be familiar with uh, the SSRS or Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels project, just a little bit of background. Um, the project is currently funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, consisting of partners from across Scotland. And it's been ongoing since about 2009 in various forms. And our most recent phase was a uh, lottery funded DCA or developing community action phase, which lasted five years. That wrapped up in March of this year. And we then entered into a two year transition phase, which is essentially an extension of that. But I'll talk a little bit about what our plans are for the next two years. Um, our report from the five year DCA phase is coming out. And um, so I'll kind of walk you through our work areas today um, and give you kind of the the wrap up summary, a little sneak peek of our five year report that'll be coming out in the next months um, and hopefully 
give you some indication of where we're headed over the next two years. Um, so across Scotland, um, our work within the squirrels project is specifically focused on areas where red squirrels are most under threat from replacement by greys. Um, you'll see on the left here is rough distribution of where we have reds uh, indicated by the red colors on the map, uh, greys in the blue, and where the species overlap in the purple. Um, our project works across the country specifically to protect this largest, this large core population of reds in the north, um, and then to support red populations in these pockets um, throughout the rest of the country to avoid replacement by greys. And so you'll see that most of our priority areas indicated by the hash marked black um, outlines are focused in these purple areas. So we have three primary uh, work zones, um, each with a different aim um, and priority. So in the Northeast, we're barreling towards eradication of this island population of greys in Aberdeenshire, as well as monitoring uh, for incursions along the Northeast coast. Along the central lowlands, we aim to contain the spread of greys into this northern red population by protecting the highland line border. And in the south, we look to reduce the densities of grey squirrels in these priority conservation areas and, and promote long-term conservation through volunteer effort and community engagement. So as I said, I'm gonna take you through a little bit of a whistle stop tour across those three areas and let you know a little bit about what's going on at the moment. Um, where we've been over the last five years and where we're headed next. So for those of you that might not be familiar with the population up in Aberdeen, this is an isolated population that was all introduced by a single introduction event um, from an escaped uh, zoo released in 1971 at the Hazelhead Zoo. Um, at the time SSRS began its work in 2009, uh, reds were almost entirely replaced within the city of Aberdeen um, by gray squirrels. Since SSRS has focused its work um, over the last 10 years, we've been able to significantly reduce the density of gray squirrels into the city center. Um, and as of earlier this year, we were finally able um, to say that we've, we've had full return of the reds uh, to both of the major rivers, so both the Dee and the Don, um, as of this past year, which is quite exciting for us. Um, and this has made the goal of eradication, a very challenging but realistic aim um, in the foreseeable future. So if we're successful in this, um, it'll be the first mainland and first urban eradication of an invasive great population of squirrels. So um, it's a big challenge we've set for ourselves and our staff up there, but we're quite excited about it. And we've seen great progress to date. Looking ahead at, to kind of how we connect those dots and work toward eradication, um, over the last few years and going ahead into the next two, the staff has been transitioning um, from active control into very low density monitoring and highly targeted and rapid response control. Um, so you'll see our trapping efforts and culling efforts on the left um, have really focused in and centered on Aberdeen City Center and um, in the areas where we've been able to remove grays on the outer borders we've implemented an army of volunteers um, to survey and monitor in order to make sure that we can have very quick and rapid response uh, for gray detections in those areas. And at the moment, our staff in the Northeast is exploring new methods for very low det density detection and removal. So um, we've got some ongoing uh, survey work, some modeling work, um, and they're looking into new opportunities um, for dray detection and uh, other forms um, of trapping and removal. Further south, um, we've also implemented in the last year and more so in going ahead into the next two, a new monitoring program, particularly in the Maroons and East Angus area. So this is the area just south of Aberdeenshire, headed up um, right along the border of the Highland Line. We found uh, in the last two years that we were seeing increasing sightings of greys uh, in this area. And this is, if you're familiar with this area of Scotland, it's a great um, corridor for greys moving forward. So we, as of this year, um, just hired a new monitoring and control officer for this area. They're working on setting up a pretty extensive volunteer network uh, throughout 
the MERNs area, again, for this low density monitoring and highly targeted and rapid response control work. Looking ahead after the two years, uh, we don't expect to achieve eradication um, in that time frame. However, we are quite committed to ensuring that the dedicated and expert staff we have working now towards that eradication goal um, is embedded into more stable uh, funding streams and support systems and able to achieve that looking ahead um, and making sure that they're supported with the necessary surveying and monitoring research that will be needed going ahead. Moving down the country into the central lowlands along the Highland Line, um, our work over the past 10 years has been focused particularly on a 10 kilometer defensive control zone and running straight across the country. Um, this has, we've had mixed results along this line. So for the most part, we've seen a general retraction of grays north of the line. Um, you'll see all the yellow squares on the right side. Um, those are all areas where we've we've lost over the last 10 years um, gray populations. Um, there have been some improvements in the red expansion, particularly in the Argyle and Trossachs area around the national park. Um, but we do continue to have sightings of grays just north of the line where we implement a quick response wherever possible. Um, the key areas where we've had trouble this year has been in the Pitlochry and Aberfeldy area in the Tayside region. Uh, the control efforts that we've been able to implement over the DCA phase and are hoping to continue into the future um, have been challenged a bit by in the last year by staffing vacancies and recruitment difficulties that I'm sure many across the sector can relate to. Um, we're fortunate, though, that our trapping and control efforts aren't completely reliant on the professional staff. Um, so we've had a lot of support from landowners participating in the forestry grant scheme. Um, track loan program. Um, our capacity, particularly with the forestry grant scheme, has been reduced in this new transition phase. And so we're working closely with Scottish forestry uh, to figure out how we can fill some of those gaps and opportunities to improve the scheme going forward. Looking ahead um, over the next two years of the project and further afield, it's our projects made it really clear to date um, that professional continued um, coordination of landscape efforts and control efforts is needed in the area. We're focusing particularly in the next two years on the Dunkeld and East Angus regions in Tayside to bulk out our volunteer network um, and control efforts there. And we'll hopefully be reevaluating um, the Argyle and Trossachs area uh, in the next calendar year in order to figure out exactly where we need to reprioritize and refocus efforts after a long-term vacancy in the area. Throughout the line, we're also continuing to monitor opportunistically um, for squirrel pox. So to date, we don't have any in indications of positive uh, pox results along the line, and we're optimistic that we can maintain that. Um, so looking ahead after the next two years, we're quite keen to figure out ways to embed uh, this coordination for the landscape effort, as well as the active control uh, with partners in the area of those local councils or statutory agencies um, to ensure that this work continues and that we protect that core red population to the north of the line. Moving then down to the very south, our work in the south has been prioritized across uh, 10 key priority areas for red squirrel conservation. So these are areas where we do have red populations. Um, over the DCA phase, we introduced three new um, areas, particularly in the Dumfries and Galway area. And over that, pe that period of the DCA phase, we also introduced and established 13 new volunteer networks um, to cover those areas. Over the last five years, uh, in addition to establishing 13 of those groups, all but four were led to be independent from SSRS support. So at the end of the DCA phase, um, most of those were able to kind of set up on their own uh, two feet to carry out the work. Um, our staff, oops, sorry, <laughs> um, as I said, all but four are now independent and our staff is continuing to support those four as well as some of these recently independent groups that still need a bit of uh, coordination and support. In the South, it has also been one of the key implementation areas for our community hubs. This is where 
we collect all of our sightings as well as track all of our um, trapping and control efforts across the country. So in terms of kind of gray and red populations at the moment and in the past uh, 10 years of work, we've seen um, similar to the Highland line, not necessarily massive increases in the red, but certainly huge uh, reductions in the gray and containment of their spread. So we've had um, red squirrel coverage in six of the 10 parks um, or priority areas increased over the DCA phase to remain pretty steady. Um, we had some declines in Berkwickshire and Nithsdale. Um, and there across all the parks was an increase in gray sightings, but we suspect that this is likely just due to surveying biases and sighting biases. In terms of the control efforts um, that are working in these areas, similar to Tayside, it's a combination of our professional staff trap loan volunteers and forestry grant scheme recipients. Over the course of the DCA phase, we saw a huge increase in the actual calling and trapping efforts. So about a 2.5 fold increase um, over that five year period. Um, one of the biggest achievements in that was the increase of the share of that calling uh, to volunteers. So we went from only about 1% at the start of the DCA phase to over 27% happening through volunteer uh, trapping efforts. Um, looking ahead, we recognize though that there's still some key support needed in some of the large estates um, that are just unfeasible for volunteers to take on. And there's a lot of our volunteer groups and volunteer trappers that are still dependent on SSRS for control training and uh, for sugar grant scheme support. So looking ahead in the South, uh, we are aiming to continue the professional coordination and delivery of those landscape control efforts, looking particularly in the Nithsdale, Annandale, and Borders area, recognizing where key gaps are and sorting out funding and opportunities to fill those gaps, as well as continuing to support our volunteer groups. Moving ahead um, to a full landscape of partially uh, professionally funded staff for, to carry out the work on the large estates, as well as um, well-supported and coordinated volunteer groups across the South carrying out community-led control and monitoring. Just a quick update on squirrel pox in Scotland over the last year. So we've been really fortunate that we haven't had any major breakouts um, over the DCA phase. This year, we've just had one positive um, indication from the Lanark area and the borders. Um, and we, have one suspected case, although it hasn't been verified in the Nith Valley. So we'll continue to monitor those. Um, at the moment, our staff is currently revising a national squirrel pox outbreak protocol, um, which will hopefully serve as good guidance, uh, not just here in Scotland, but for other areas. Um, and then we're also working with our colleagues at the Royal Dick uh, School of Veterinary Studies to promote more uh, post-mortem testing to increase our surveying um, options. Uh, not quite squirrel pox, but just kind of an inter interesting trend that we've seen in the last year. Um, we have seen an uptick in leprosy reports, um, particularly in the Northeast. Uh, we don't quite know why this is or what it means, but it's something that uh, we're looking into with our colleagues. So just kind of looking ahead, um, bigger picture across the project into this transition phase. In addition to carrying out the control and support, that I talked about for our regions. We're also looking to figure out how we can ensure minimum distribution monitoring going forward. So we've stopped our annual spring surveys um, and so figuring out, working with our partners exactly what needs to replace that system going forward. Um, continuing the public outreach and use of the community hub. And most importantly, figuring out uh, with other agencies, how we embed this coordination and control delivery into long-term uh, fully funded streams going forward. So that'll come in the form of what we're calling our legacy plan, uh, which will hopefully be coming out in the next six months or so. So with that, um, for those of you in Scotland, just a friendly reminder to please report your sightings this week as part of the Great Scottish Squirrel Survey. And for those of you that are regional, we do have a few events where you can come and meet some of our staff um, and volunteer groups and learn a little bit more about the regional work going on. And with that, 
That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Nicole. Really great to hear about uh, the future as SSRS, which has been such an important project in Scotland for red squirrels. Thank you. And, and finally, but far, by far not least, <laughs> we've moved over to Steve uh, to look at England. Thanks very much, Steve. Can you see my screen? I can, yes. Excellent. Um, I can't can see, see any participants. The, but, we can um, see all the slides at the moment. Great. Um, Well, good morning, um, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak, Kay. Um, I'm Steve Trotter, uh, and I'm wearing two hats today. Uh, firstly, I chair the UK Squirrel Accord Red Squirrel Subcommittee, um, and I'm also a trustee of the Red Squirrel Survival Trust. Um, and um, I'm kind of uh, simply reporting the hard work of others up and down the country and their superb achievements. And that includes hundreds, if not thousands, of volunteers who are putting in effort around, across England to, uh, to conserve this most precious of species. Um, and there's a lot of activity going on across England. And I think probably the, the overall picture, the overall, overall story is that good progress is being made. But, you know, we look at, you know, some particularly Northern Ireland with, uh, with envy in terms of your recovery success story and uh, you know perhaps that's where we want to be uh, as soon as possible um i'm going to talk about three three areas uh, so i'm going to do a quick tour around the regions of england uh with news of things that have been going on talk a bit about some of the uk squirrel accord activity we've been doing in england and uh, up, update everybody a bit on the red squirrel survival trust and what the trust has been doing over the past year so uh, I want to start out with the Isle of Wight now. Um, the Isle of Wight is unique in England in that uh, it still has intact and extant populations of red squirrels, no greys, a completely grey squeeze, great grey free squirrel zone. So, you know, if you want to take a, a go to see a place that has a vision of how England should be, how the rest of the UK should be, go to the Isle of Wight and see the marvellous um, work that they're doing in some of the woodlands and uh, in conserving red squirrels. And the White Squirrels Group undertakes their annual count. This is um, and a huge amount of work to conserve the squirrels there. This was last year's um, map, sorry, the year before last 2020 map, and this was last year's map. So I think indicating a fairly uh, stable situation on the Isle of Wight. Um, and this year, uh, genetic studies have, have identified and confirmed the fact that Isle of Wight red squirrels are, on all, you know, on the face value, they're exactly the same as the rest of the squirrels in the UK, but there are slight differences um, genetically. So they are unique and they are a distinct um, group, which is uh, really fascinating and another, re another really important justification for the conservation work that the group does down in the Isle of Wight. And the, the group uh, assiduously map roadkill. So we'd have an even better population if it wasn't for artificial uh, mortality caused by roadkills. And this is, a, I think last year I showed uh, some data sets showing um, uh, the, the numbers of squirrels sadly killed on the roads on the Isle of Wight. But this shows a geographic spatial distribution of, of deaths. So fairly, uh, fairly closely, obviously, mapping the roads and the, uh, the squirrel um, distribution on the island. Um, and I think the group has also been doing quite, quite a bit of work this year on the impacts of rat poison that's being used for other purposes, obviously for rats and its impacts on squirrels, which I think uh, is a matter for great concern and perhaps something that the squirrel community needs to consider more widely. We know well the impacts on owls and other birds of prey, but uh, the impacts on red squirrels, again, just becoming apparent. But I think the most important news to report from the Isle of Wight um, is the, the amazing and inspirational Helen Butler, who's been working on the Isle of Wight for, for over 30 years now, has uh, produced uh, a new book, a new publication, which summarises and brings together all of their experience, all of her knowledge and expertise gained through 30 years of conservation work on the Isle of Wight and presented in one volume. And uh, apparently this is now, this is going to be launched tomorrow. So it is hot off the press. And I recommend everybody on the call should buy a copy. I think it's uh, you know really important that we share the experience and the knowledge 
that's been accumulated over 30 years on the Isle of Wight around the, the, red, the UK red squirrel community because it's full of insights, full of full of factual information and evidence-based information and uh, you know, a really valuable read. And uh, it, if you Google it, it's uh, available from the Isle of Wight Museum and directly, I think, from Helen. Uh, at a, a snip at £35, I think the actual cost of the publication was more like £65, so heavily subsidised, but very much worth the read. And an amazing achievement, which is a, a tribute to Helen and the group's work over 30 years or so. So absolutely inspirational stuff. And I'm looking forward to getting a copy. Um, so moving north, um, looking at Lancashire and Merseyside. Um, obviously, the vast majority of the red squirrel population is focused on the Formby, Sefton coast area. Um, and the groups, the Lancashire Wildlife Trust group and the uh, Nosley group and the, the range of volunteers are involved in red squirrel conservation in Lancashire uh, are undergoing the uh, monitoring and grey management across the county. And uh, this is a map, a recent map that the group has produced of the overall distribution of reds and greys, uh, particularly within the Formby area, as you can see. But uh, what's really exciting is that um, with all the, uh, the work that's been going on, increasingly reds are being are popping up all over the county and in new places, unexpected places um, around the county, not just on Formby. And uh, in April to June this year, the groups had around 280 red squirrel sightings reported, which is great news. Um, although the, uh, you know, the issues with greys continue, this is uh, the 2021 sighting map. So as you can see, the majority of sightings, again, focused in and concentrated on the Formby area, but as you can see, little red dots are appearing um, across the county. And this has even been picked up by the media and uh, the wider population. So, you know, opening up some really interesting opportunities for engaging with new audiences. Um, as hopefully this trend continues as the reds start to, uh, move out in response to some of the work that's been going on and uh, work for example I think I mentioned this last year but the Reclaiming Reds project led by the Nosley Safari and funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund has been doing brilliant work to engage people um, in Nosley and Liverpool and the local communities to really get people on side and to spread the word about red squirrels alongside doing the key grade management work uh, that will kind of lay the foundation for the recovery of reds into um, Lancashire, which is fantastic news. And this is, a, again, a map I think I showed last year, which documents the presence of species and their uh, trends over the last 20 or so, 20, 30 years or so. So, you know, initially a, grad, a picture and a trend of retreat and decline. And now, thanks to the work of all the volunteers and Lancashire Wildlife Trust and Nosley Safari, uh, things are starting to turn around and uh, the picture's looking a bit more positive. Although, as with all of the um, reports I'm uh, talking about this morning, there is no room for complacency whatsoever. And the situation in England overall, apart from the Isle of Wight, is pretty precarious still and no room for complacency. And the Reclaiming Reds programme in Nosley is, is progressing extremely well. Really impressive uh, work being done by the partnership in Nosley. Um, and I'm green with envy. This is a, this is, I pinched this um, uh, from the project's website. But, you know, the more we can do this kind of really uh, eye-catching graphic and uh, get the messages out there to wider communities, the better, I think. And uh, we look forward to engaging more people in the story uh, of uh, red recovery in Lancashire in the coming weeks, months and years. Moving rapidly on to Northern England. Um, where I'm based. Um, Red Squirrels Northern England, the kind of umbrella organisation led by Northumberland Wildlife Trust, but with a whole range of other supporting organisations involved, including Forestry England, uh, Cumbria Wildlife Trust, Lancashire Wildlife Trust, and a whole range of Red Squirrel groups, Northern Red Squirrels, for example, has just published the results of its annual Red and Grey Squirrel Survey, um, which is available for download on the website, and once again confirms that Red squirrels are found in all seven counties across the north of England in varying concentrations. And the monitoring programme is the only really good scientific evidence that's confirming 
the collective red squirrel conservation effort is really making a difference across the north of England. So all of the work, the fantastic work that's being done by local red squirrel groups um, and agencies and the charities is having an impact and is bearing fruits. But it's a long process and we need to continue the effort. As I say, the um, data, this is a, a map of the 2021 sightings. The data basically, this is red squirrel sightings across the north. The data is showing that, um, you know, in some areas we're seeing gains of red squirrels where great management is effective. In others, we're still seeing uh, expansion of greys into red areas. So there's this constant interplay between the two species going on with win, winners, winning areas that are, you know, winning the battle, areas that are losing the battle. So as I say, this is a constant, um, constant fight to ensure that reds survive and are able to thrive in grey-free gray zones across the north. So no room for complacency. Overall, the results show that the red squirrels are, in, are found in 53.2% of the 235 sites sampled and surveyed between March and May uh, this year, which uh, was the same result as last year, uh, which is fantastic news and, you know, tribute to all of the hard work that's gone into that result. Uh, encouragingly, grey squirrels were found in 57% of survey sites. I say it's encouraging. It doesn't sound encouraging, does it? But that's a down from last year. So last year, it's 59.9 or 6% of survey sites had grey squirrels. So again, a reassuring trend. Um, and it's notable that since 2015, red occupancy hasn't gone down. It's up. So reds can still be seen across a large area in Northern England. And the message is a good one, positive, encouraging news. But as I say, absolutely no room for complacency or to sit on our laurels in terms of um, uh, effort. And the effort has been a major one. And this, these dots show um, where the effort of staff and hundreds of community volunteers have been putting in their time and energy to try to uh, ensure red conservation across the region. So. You know, you know, absolutely vital to note that without all of the consistent, dedicated, dedicated effort from rangers, volunteers, landowners, and others, we would not be in the position we're in today. We would have lost red squirrels many years ago, and you know, without the effort, we could lose them again in three, four, five years' time if we stop our our, our efforts. So, the vigilance is really vital and well done. And thank you so much to everybody that's been involved in this this. Uh, collaborative effort across the board. Um, RSNA produced this um, uh, infographic which shows the 2002 effort uh, in numbers. So this is the annual monitoring stats. I won't read them all out, um, but you can see that uh, it's a mega effort, you know, 235 surveys across getting on for 3000 woodlands and gardens surveyed since 2012. So amazing effort and uh, all very worthwhile um, again all of this is available on the website should you wish to interrogate the data and the numbers a bit further and again just to just to uh, reiterate this the this is a map from northern red squirrels which is the umbrella body for all of the local red squirrel groups in the north um, of the country cumbria and northumberland um, and it shows the coverage that we have of volunteer groups in the north mapped on on the left and on the right is the distribution of reds and the red squirrel strongholds and conservation areas so great color correlation but interesting one of the things we need to, i do think we do need to look at with the forthcoming red squirrel action plan in england is you know how do we make sure we get complete coverage and join up with the excellent uh, maps that uh, nicole showed earlier of, of the across the borders of the the new groups that are working in Scotland. How do we make sure we cut across the border? Uh, one of the political things around in the, the North is that actually the border is a, is a fake border set up by the Romans and Hadrian. And actually there's more that we share across that boundary than divides us. And we've got to make sure that red squirrels don't suffer as a result of subsequent political boundaries. So we do need to joint, jointly collaborate and work with our friends and colleagues across the border in, the interests of red squirrel conservation um, and uh, you know just to reiterate that 
this is a mega effort and mega impact that we're having. Um, and this is accumulated, with, this probably needs updating at some time. Again, credit to Mike Denbury and his team in Red Squirrels, Northern England, for all of this data and mapping. They, they do an absolutely amazing job of crunching the numbers and the information that comes in from volunteers. And uh, this is the spread of red squirrel distribution based on presence and absence in grid squares in two, two by two, two tetrads, I think, two by two kilometer grid squares by the look of it, between 2018 and 20. And I suspect if you add in the 2022 data, it will be more or less the same, perhaps with a few gains and a few losses elsewhere. So, you know, a, a, a really encouraging picture but no room for complacency, I think, is the core message. And other things that have been happening across the north and across England, uh, British Red Squirrels, and uh, with support from uh, the range of organisations at the bottom, you can see in the slide there, and local volunteer groups have been running a series of Grey Squirrel Management Training workshops, um, which have been going really well and very popular. And I think there's a, 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 a new schedule being planned um, so that we can get more people, more volunteers on board and participating, because that's what it's really about, um, whether it's monitoring or whether it's doing other things. Right, so that's a quick trip around the regions. I wanted to just quickly talk a bit about UK, UK Squirrel Accord activity under the auspices of the Red Squirrel Subcommittee, which I chair. And just a quick reminder, this is a group that's made up of all of the organisations organizations you can see listed on this uh, slide and one of four subgroups working to support the work of Kay Hall as UK coordinator and um, we've been doing quite a bit of work albeit at various speeds through the year um, and the first and most probably most significant of those is the England Red Squirrel Action Plan which is about to hit the streets um, I, th I think uh, the final draft is in DEFRA, I hope. Kate can confirm or deny that. Um, and the, essentially, this is uh, aimed at helping align and coordinate action for red squirrels across England at a whole range of different levels. And these are the four core aims, very similar to the other action plans across the UK. So I won't read those out, um, but really it's about making progress and uh, you know bringing red squirrels back consolidating what we have and getting onto the front foot and bringing red squirrels back through a series of actions over the coming years and key to all of this is to protect and strengthen the red squirrel populations that we already have across the current range so you know you won't be surprised to see that that list of key actions so it's about you know sustaining the gray squirrel management control until other things like fertility or hopefully pine martins provide a sustainable long-term non-lethal, well, it, isn't, it is lethal in terms of pine martins, of course, but uh, long-term um, uh, opportunities for gray, gray, squee, gray squirrel free areas into which reds can spread to make sure we get the habitat management right. And I noted the comments in the, um, the Q&A about uh, forestry management, I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, new approach at a local level to integrating action um, in some of these strongholds, standardising monitoring and surveying, and you know making sure that we control and reduce the disease, disease risks risks that we have from squirrel pox and other things, um, and respond to that effectively. One of the key areas will be to revise the approach to strongholds. Now we've had strongholds since the 1990s, uh, but and we have seven complexes across the north um, with red squirrel reserves. Really, I think is the analysis. Uh, so good, some good things, you know, we still have red squirrels in most of them, not all, but most of them. Missed. So it's, we're looking to overhaul the approach and um, uh, redefine some of these areas locally. And probably the most important thing is to bring partners together across these stronghold areas around a new focus plan so that we are all singing on this as far as we possibly can. I know this is difficult in the, particularly in the Red Squirrel community sometimes, but to try and get everybody working on the same uh, wavelength and agenda so that we're all working in the same, um, pulling in the same direction for Red Squirrels. Uh, 
uh, which could be quite exciting and hopefully some funding will go with that. Um, and I've just mentioned that. So a bit more of a joined up effort and to make sure we avoid those spatial gaps that we, I mentioned before. Second, uh, second key thing is to you know, work towards getting fertility control licensed and rolled out. So you know, having this non-lethal uh, additional tool in our toolbox in the armory to uh, manage the grey squirrel populations. Make sure that we standardize the monitoring and data management, which I know RSNE have already made great strides in achieving so far, thanks to support, financial support from RSST. Um, so a whole range of things around the action plan that we're going to be uh, hopefully de delivering in the next few years. Second big thing the Accord has been, the subgroup has been working on um, is new guidance for forestry operations. And this is really being led by Rebecca Eistead and Forestry Commission in partnership with the Accord. And um, this will be, this is work in progress that uh, Rebecca may want to talk about later. I think she's on the call. Um, but so it's work in progress and is due to be um, published in the near future. But the idea of this is really to provide a really strong best practice guidance to forestry operations so that we minimise potential conflict between forestry operations and red squirrels. Uh, but more than that, actually move on to the positive uh, footing of you know, showing how forestry operations can actually, as we all know, contribute really positively to red squirrel conservation. So we're looking forward to that one coming out in the, in the, in the near, not too distant future. Um, similarly, uh, quite a bit of work took place on red squirrel translocation, uh, particularly over the last few years. But in during COVID, there were a couple of workshops with the Zoological Society of London, sponsored by Natural England and the Accord, to look at how do we apply the IUCN principles to make sure that we're not we're translocating in a responsible way and in a way that's going to have a long-term impact and success. And that work wasn't quite completed, but the good news is that Natural England are able to um, fund the next stages of that work, and that will hopefully be happening uh, next year. Uh, and uh, quite a bit of work has been going on in the background to get that into place uh, between Kay and Natural England, which is fantastic. And um, lastly, just to mention the Grey Squirrel Action Plan, but this is, this is a DEFRA document being led by the Forestry Commission, being written by the Forestry Commission, Rebecca Eistead, and uh, the, I think the, the committee has contributed to this, although it's not a, uh, a UK Squirrel Accord document. So again, the two action plans for Red Squirrels and for Grey Squirrels need to go hand in hand, and hopefully we're working effectively to make sure that they are uh, very closely integrated and joined up and uh, who knows they may even be launched about the same time um, we will see so that's uh, a quick trip around the accord activity on red squirrel issues in england lastly i just wanted to very quickly talk a, a bit about some of the red squirrel survival trust activity uh, now this is very very you know there's a huge amount going on so this is very much a um, a very just qu a, a quick summary and please do look at the RSST website for further information but I just wanted to to mention the photography competition uh, which happened in 2022 which was absolutely amazing I think attracted over 250 entries you know we we talk a lot about action plans and grey squirrel management and all the rest of it but actually sometimes it's great to just stand back and appreciate just what an amazing species red squirrels are and 250 people have managed to capture the spirit and essence of red squirrels in most the most beautiful and uh, appealing way. And the winner of the competition was Stephen Smith. Congratulations, Stephen. Uh, with, this is his winning entry. Uh, and uh, there were, I think, three runner-up prizes went to Ian Groves. This amazing picture in, of a red squirrel in bluebells. John Allen with a, a lovely picture taken from Great Asby in Cumbria. Cumbria and Ruth Chamberlain from a tree in Penrith, again in Cumbria. So absolutely amazing, uh, least successful competition. And great to engage people and celebrate red squirrels. And uh, RSST has also recognised, we've re reintroduced the Volunteer of the Year Award for the red squirrel conservation sector last year. And um, nominations are. Came, came in, a large number of nominations came in and 
Um, the award went to um, Gerald McCorkin from uh, the Glens Red Squirrel Group in Northern Ireland, which is, I think had been working, doing amazingly dedicated and inspirational work with the group for the last six years. So congratulations to Gerard and uh, on, on your amazing work and thank you for all of your work. And uh, I just wanted to mention this because the, the nominations for next year's award are about to open. So please do keep an eye on the RSST website for details of how to nominate people you would like to see get this uh, amazing award. Um, RSST is continuing to work with Danny Connor Wild, who's um, a young person who does specialises in doing uh, social media films. I nearly said videos, but that's showing my age. Um, clips and media, media to engage uh, Red Squirrels with a new audience. And uh, a number of Danny's films have been really, really successful and popular. And if you want to see some of them, uh, they're on the, her YouTube channel. Um, or on they're accessible through the uh, through the website address here, and uh, she, her filmmaking continues to attract lots of new audiences to Red Squirrels and get the messages across about how wonderful they are and how much they need people's help. So it's great that RSST is able to sponsor um, that work. Really important stuff. But probably the biggest achievement I think from RSST uh, and the Accords perspective this year has been to continue the. Um, sponsoring the fertility control project with the animal and plant health agency and uh, this has now entered uh, the fourth year of its work fourth of fifth, the fifth year um, and uh, as i'm sure many of you saw it got huge publicity thanks to Kay uh, for the team in apha uh, over the summer this is um uh, back in i think it was back in july um the uh, fertility control project got widespread coverage national coverage uh, which was great and uh, the uh, in year four the project's been really focusing on testing two of the promising candidates for the oral contraceptive one is a, a vaccine and the other is a cholesterol inhibiting chemical called diazacon and uh, the team in APHA have been conducting trials with uh, various formulations of diazacon uh, combined with taste masking agents because the grey squirrels unfortunately don't like the taste of the, the chemical and they've been uh, trying various uh, formulations of the bait which has uh, seen a significant increase in consumption compared to unmasked diazacon so the research is continuing to make really great progress and really encouraging progress to ensure that dose uptake, uptake will be uh, strong when we get to rolling out or when they get to the stage of rolling out into the field trial stage, which is fantastic. Field work has shown that daily rates of individual bait uptake by squirrels can be really high as well. And um, uh, so, you know, there's lots of ins and outs of this and uh, they're now focusing their attention on the vaccine candidate. And um, throughout year four, they've been uh, looking at the formulation for the vaccine um, with a whole range of different um, types of bait and dosage rates with improving the antibody response to the vaccine in the bait. So lots of work still going on and um, lots of really encouraging results coming through. If you want to read more in more detail about the, uh, the update, an update has been produced for uh, the UK Squirrel Accord, which was published in September and is available on the website. So. So do have a look at that. But in terms of field trials, um, in parallel to the work on the actual, the two, um, the two chemicals, the project's also been testing hoppers and gray squirrel bait update. And that work's been continuing um, this year. And previous data demonstrated that the feeders exclude most non-target wildlife. And hence the view that a conceptive, contraceptive could be deployed safely in most areas. And the field trials, trials this year have been about testing whether we could, they could use squirrel body weight to design a cost-effective feeder that would exclude reds, but allow greys to access the, the contraceptive formulation. So that's all been going positively. Um, and um, in uh, December, January 21, 22, APHA selected two woods in Northumberland where 
uh, working with local volunteers, the red squirrels um, were present and the purpose design feeders were being tested. So the, the team measured red squirrel body weight and uh, uh, compared and contrast those weights with uh, gray squirrels from Yorkshire at the same time of year. And the results suggest that wet body weight could be a way of discriminating between the two species in the use of these um, feeders. And uh, if successful, that'd be great news because it will enable the use of the bait and uh, reduce the risk of reds picking it, picking it up. So um, I know the um, team is looking forward to working more with red, local red squirrel groups across various areas in the future. And finally, just before I finish, the, uh, the next phase of the Northern England uh, lottery project applications is about to be submitted hopefully by January. Um, and the idea is that Red Squirrels Northern England, the Wildlife Trust in, in the North, local Red Squirrel groups, uh, Animal Plant Health Agency in the Squirrel Accord and a group from the borders will be getting together to submit a four to five million pound lottery bid uh, to take forward all of the work we've been talking about in terms of people engagement, rolling out more grey squirrel management work, but also most importantly, in rolling out to the next stage, the uh, fertility control project and programme so that we can move towards licensing and really securing this kind of advancing technology for red squirrel conservation in the north of England, um, as well as you know management of greys elsewhere in the country for forestry purposes. So really exciting times, lots of progress, but still lots to do. And uh, thank you, uh, Kate, I shall end there. Cheers. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Steve. And uh, again, with lots of the other countries, so much, so much work going on to, to try and protect our red squirrels. And it's so important. Um, just to pick up on the England Red Squirrel Action Plan and Grey Squirrel Action Plans, as Steve said, um, they are both with uh, DEFRA at the moment for ministerial sign off. Um, so the uh, Red Squirrel Action Plan will be owned by the UK Squirrel Accord, but with DEFRA as a, as a key stakeholder, as their, a key signatory to the accord. Um, and as Steve said, Grey Squirrel Action Plan will be owned by DEFRA. And Forestry Commission, but um, hoping very much that they can both be published in the very near future. Um, so I think now we'll move on to the question and answer session. So I don't know if everyone wants to turn their videos back on. That's fantastic. Um, I'll just go down some of the questions. Um, Katie, uh, you said red squirrels are now found in 50 woods in Northern Ireland. How many woods are there in Northern Ireland or what percentage of the kind of area of Northern Ireland does that kind of cover? Oh, um... Ish. <laughs> No idea. We haven't done that yet. We yeah. are going to look at that. So we will basically be hoping to look at percentages of what woodland we covered and that what, what woodlands we find squirrels in. So off the top of my head, I honestly have no idea. I mean, yeah. we are the least far, forested country out of all of them. Um, so a lot of our woodlands are, you know, small fragmented in populations and there's no, no kind of, it's not a coincidence that the healthiest populations of red squirrels and pine martens are in our most wooded kind of areas. But I'll have that figure at some point. <laughs> That's great. Thanks so much, Katie. Um, Rebecca or Becky, um, uh, there's a question from Ian Lake. He said, they're very interested in the work in Wales and the apparent interest by the forestry industry in the presence of red squirrels. There seems to be less interest in some areas of England uh, and they fell if there are reds there or not. Um, can you just update us on anything to do with kind of felling and, and red squirrels? Yeah, so um, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, yeah, so, you know, Natural Resources Wales are the main um, body um, or who manage the Welsh Government Woodland Estate. Obviously, there are private uh, forestry um, owners uh, and workers as well. Uh, but if there are any felling operations, you know, that will come through as a, as a licensable activity if they want to fell an area. And that will then be passed through the, the species team uh, and we'll look at those applications um, to make sure that uh, red squirrels are taken into consideration and certainly within the Welsh Government Woodland Estate yeah as I mentioned in my talk you know we are working with the local red squirrel groups we have regular meetings with them and so on and they have um, uh, you know they, they can view the, the the felling operations the forestry resource plans and so on so they're, they're fully aware of when felling or thinning is to take place and we will discuss certain areas if there's a red squirrel area 
and, and work with them basically yeah Great, thanks, Becky. Uh, and just to update in England, um, uh, the Forestry Commission uh, with the UK Squirrel Accord is working on some best practice guidance for felling operations in red squirrel areas that we hope will be useful for people and um, foresters to be able to pick up on uh, and to understand, you know, what to do if there are red squirrels in their area and to be able to pass that knowledge on. Uh, and that should be um, should be published in the next few months. We're hoping so. Um, Nicole, is there any prospect of restarting the Scottish Annual Spring Survey? Yeah, um, it's not the, the positive answer that I, I think people <coughs> probably want. So under the, the current kind of funding restraints of the two year extension project, um, unfortunately, we just we do not have the staff or the resources. Um, I think looking ahead into the future, we're very cognizant of what a loss it is to our data and to the, the country's data set, not having that standardized survey. So uh, we've, we're currently recruiting a master's student to um, look at some alternatives to the style of the survey and see if we can find some more cost-effective and capacity-effective means going forward. Um, but part of that legacy plan that I very briefly mentioned will address, uh, yeah, exactly what that needs to look like going ahead. And um, I think in its previous form. Unfortunately, we won't be able to reinstate it for the next uh, two years at least, but we're optimistic that some of our partner agencies might be able to take on some of that effort and hopefully we'll be able to get the same data um, just in a more effective and efficient means. Great, thanks very much, Nicole. Um, question on pine martins. Do we need a review of pine martin rage expansion and the extent, extent of the Sheehy effect, which is referring to Emma Sheehy's work on, on pine martins, if anyone's interested? And are there now areas in Scotland where greys are effectively suppressed by pine martins? And is that area expanding? Yeah, so I can maybe take a stab at this, but I, I suspect others might want to jump in. Um, so we don't know exactly if there's areas where pine martens are suppressing the greys um, for a long time our our work in scotland has been a, a two species story and um, we're working at the moment to to expand that out into a three species story so um our team has had the first in the last year the first sightings uh, confirmed sightings and um occurrences of pine martens in the Mearns area and all the way up into nearly the center of Aberdeen City, which is very exciting. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, Emma Sheehy is our conservation officer up in the Northeast, leading that eradication team. Um, so we're very cognizant of, of looking into the role that the Pine Martins are playing. Um, I think we're, we probably aren't quite at a place where Pine Martin populations are large enough to be uh, actively controlling or reducing gray squirrel populations, but we have a suspicion that they are playing a role in keeping those, those numbers down where we've reduced the densities, um, but we'll need further research to be able to confirm that. I could, I could jump, jump in yeah. there, okay? Just add a few things to that. Um, and I see someone was asking, you know, why why do pine martens um, have this effect? Um, I didn't want to type it because it was it's too complicated, really, isn't it? Um, it? It's there's a lot going on, and I suppose the main thing is that pine martens and red squirrels are native, so they've kind of coexisted alongside each other for a long time, and um, red squirrels are very aware of pine martens as a predator. Um, there's a few a few different kind of. Um, series of thoughts on this. Um, I suppose we know that pine martens predate both reds and greys, um, but um, they seem to, there was some new research that showed that pine martens will kind of focus on greys in drays and that they'll target them in drays. Um, greys don't seem to be as aware of pine martens. They're also a bit slower, maybe a bit easier to catch, um, but also you can't underestimate the fact that pine martens are quite lazy and opportunistic feeders, so they're not going to really go out of their way to get something unless they have to. They eat a whole range of things. Um, so we've seen quite a bit. We have some video footage of pine martens getting greys at feeders, um, which is just mad to watch. Um, but 
we know that they, they predate both, but the, the basically the story has so many different kind of things going on that we need. We need more research because every time we get a bit more research, it adds something else to that story and um, finding out the relationship between the three. But from our monitoring work, we have seen areas with no control where grades have disappeared from when Pine Martins moved in. And we know that that's happening. Um, and we've also seen the fact that High Martins cannot have an impact in areas where there is low woodland cover and there are at a low density. So it's only when Pine Martins are at a really high density that they can have this impact um, on greys. But the whole thing's really interesting and because um, our Pine Martins are spread so much, that is why we, ha we have to be focused on them. And as you say, Nicole, it's like a three species story now. Um, and we have to bring them in and we have to keep monitoring them um, to see this kind of change over time. But uh, it's it's really interesting. Um, and just one side note as well, um, you know, with the increase of a predator, it, it brings conflict, unfortunately. And um, we've already seen that happen in areas, you know, where um, they nest in people's roofs and they kill chickens. And um, we had an unfortunate incident this year where we have very few barn owls in Northern Ireland, and we caught on camera Pine Martin predating barn owl chicks. Um, so this is like a new thing for us, you know, two priority species um, going head to head here. So um, yeah, the Pine Martin story is kind of ongoing. Thanks. Oh, I would, add, I would add yeah. rather than the question, the question talked about should we review it? I, I'm not sure we need to review it, but I certainly think we've got to keep a close eye on it. So I agree with everything that. Katie and Nicole have said, you know, we've got to monitor the impact. And in England, we know that, you know, as a, a separate species priority, reintroduction and re-establishment of pine martins, which were, you know, wiped out through persecution in the 19th century, early 20th century, you know, is a conservation priority in its own right. And we've got to keep a close eye on, monitor it, and what impact it does have at the moment. Reintroduction programmes have taken place in, uh, in the Forest of Dean, and there are proposals elsewhere. Pine Martins are getting into North Cumbria now, coming in across the borders um, and being seen more widely. And there are proposals for further reintroduction programmes in the Southwest. So I think we're just going to keep an eye on it and see how that progresses. And I've, something somebody said earlier about, you know, uh, you know, there's, you know, the work that Emma Sheehy and um, and uh, is it Aberdeen University have been doing on Pine Martins is really, really positive and encouraging, but there are lots of unknowns still. So we've just got to be slightly cautious and just see how it goes and watch what happens. And I know there is some nervousness among some red squirrel groups in Cumbria about whether you know isolated pockets of red squirrels could be could be hammered by you know a really strong recovery of pine martins. If 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 the choreography is slightly wrong, you know, if pine martins recover qu quicker than the reds. So you know, we, there's lots we don't know. You know, I'm talking anecd you know, anecdotally. Um, so we've got to be evidence-based and, and keep it under close surveillance, I think, and respond, adapt accordingly. But um, personally, all the, all, of the, everything, all the evidence I've seen is just really powerful and in encouraging. And, you know, we look forward to, um, you know, potentially the positive impacts of pine martin recovery and red squirrels. And, and there's uh, quite a lot of research being done into it, isn't it, by people like the Vincent Wildlife Trust, who yeah. are um, yeah. uh, key to the pine martin recovery work, yeah. aren't they? The one, the, the one final, before I shut up, the one final observation I would make is the thing that does make us nervous in Cumbria, well, certainly in Cumbria Wildlife Trust, is the um, um, clearly there seems to be a density issue. So, you know, the, the, the decline in grey effect and increasing red effect doesn't seem to take place until you get to a certain density of pine martin populations, which is hard probably to define. What worries me about some of the translocation, uh, the, the kind of trend and pat fashion for translocations is, are we, you know, depleting, nat you know, recovering populations in Scotland, which is where most of the individuals are coming from for translocation in England, and delaying the recovery of the right density of pine martins in Scotland. And I'm not sure we know enough about that. So, you know, is it right for us, you know, generally to, to steam ahead with reintroduction projects, which are taking animals from the wild in Scotland and, you know, reducing densities up there when we know it takes so long for the species to breed and recover. So mm. that's my only query. It's not, you know, it's, you know, 
you know, very positive about recovering the population, but the question is how and at what speed you do it. Yeah. And getting the choreography right. Becky, did you want to mention any of the projects going on in Wales in terms of primary? Yeah, I was um, certainly Steve was intimating there. So the Vincent Wildlife Trust uh, undertook a Pine Martin um, reintroduction or reinforcement, I think they called it in the end, uh, of Pine Martin in Wales. And they did bring down uh, 50 or so, I think it was, uh, Pine Martin over two or three years. So, you know, they have started to um, breed successfully and so on in Wales. And there's also um, a project up in Northwest Wales. I think it's part of the Magical Mammals project where they're working on um, captive bred Pine Martin um to, to release those into the wild but uh yeah again all of those things that everyone said already uh you know we need to keep an eye on this particularly you know in wales we have small very small tracts of forest where we've got the red squirrels and cocainogs a very low population and uh, we did have footage of a pine martin um on the release enclosures the red squirrel release enclosures back in uh, 20, uh 2017 i think it was and it was kind of playing cat and mouse with a red squirrel inside the enclosure pine martin was on the outside sort of trying to pour in at the squirrel and so on and so forth so yeah absolutely we do know that they will prey on reds when they can and yeah precarious sort of situation over in kind of with such a small population um yeah but I, th I think we definitely need to um you know get a better angle on on pine martin effects in wales so uh, i've made some notes <laughs> uh, that, that was when i mentioned choreography that's what i was trying to get at you know the question in my mind and i may be totally wrong but if you get a recovery of pine martin populations first mm. will that prevent recovery of reds or yeah. you know movement yeah. of reds into those areas or, you know, do you have to establish the reds first? Then, then they can tolerate recovery of pine yeah. I don't know. That's just the question I think that's been raised. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. we're looking at that. Sorry, we're looking at that at the minute because we actually right. have a few, a few areas that were like historically grey squirrel free for some reason um, and massive population of pine martens only, the only species out of the three. Um, so, and one of them, we're actually doing a translocation with Belfast City, so we will be able to see if I don't know if these red squirrels just disappear because there's too many pine martens around or or what. But it's it, it's something that um yeah we're looking at. It's a really interesting one. Fascinating. Be interested mm. to see how that goes. Yeah. yeah. Now, it's definitely important that we keep up with the research side of things and the evidence base, as, as everyone has said in this. Um, but um, but hopefully it will be it will be really successful the pine martin and the red squirrel. Um, how can people join in with red squirrel conservation in their areas? I know you've kind of all touched on this a little bit, but just to reiterate, um, you know, because there was some fantastic work going on through the organisations, through the Accord, but especially through the red squirrel community groups, who really are a tour de force for red squirrel conservation. Um, but yeah, if um, I mean, there, there's information on each of the different websites, I think, and, and, and if you watch this again, but um, yeah, if, if people want to get involved, then yeah, I don't know, Steve, did you want to mention? Uh, well, just a just quick, quick response to that is uh, do volunteer, get involved, yeah. so join, a, join an organisation, donate, volunteer, yeah, you know, that's support, be supportive of, uh, you know, initiatives in your local patch, you know, yeah. yeah, yeah so it's Report sightings, that's that's really important. If you don't want to give up too much of your time or you don't have a lot of time, um, sightings is really important. Yeah, that's it. And red and grey sightings across the whole yeah, yeah. of the countries, really. So so we get an idea of both what both squirrels are doing. The other, the other one, if you're not in a red squirrel area, don't feed grey squirrels. Well, don't feed grey squirrels full stop is a good one. Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, there was a question that somebody emailed in. Um, what should people do to protect red squirrels if squirrel pox virus is identified in an area? Um, so report it, report it to um, your local authority as soon as possible. Um, and also we say if you are feeding squirrels in that area, remove those feeders just right away. There's, um, we have a protocol on this um, on the Northern Ireland Squirrel Forum website. Um, but yeah, remove anything that can cause cross-contamination um, between the species, basically. 
Maybe just to add to that too, I think depending on on your area. So um, reporting to your local authorities is, is really key there. Obviously, certainly take down the, the theaters, um, but reporting to the, your, your authority in Scotland, that's usually us um, and the SSPCA. So there's dealing with the um, infected reds, obviously, but there's also the matter of trapping those, those grays that are introducing the virus and trying to minimize their spread um, into the further red populations. So kind of getting that trapping effort and control effort right away, I think is really important in the response. Definitely. Um, we had, um, I didn't mention it in my talk, but we actually had an outbreak of pox last year um, in a small little pocket that had both reds and greys. And um, we only had six reds in this area um, and they all died. Um, so we we didn't get confirmed pox because we didn't get any of them, but um, you know with photos and things, and we think that's what it was. Um, but I just showed you that it's not a way, and um, it's still a problem. And this is the issue with all these little tiny populations of reds, and how long will that take to recover now? You know, so um, yeah, it is a bit of a bit of a scary one. Yeah, it, I mean, I would agree with with all all of those as well, and you know, similar sorts of protocols uh, across the country. I think, and um, I do remember um, a few years back in uh, um, uh, around the Formby area, the population there, they had a squirrel pox outbreak, and I think they lost about ninety percent of the population, sadly. But there was one animal, I think, one red squirrel that was was captured and taken into a to veterinary care, and it did recover. So I don't know that we know all the detail behind that. I'm sure somebody may know the detail, but I thought that was quite interesting. So I think it's um, the earlier that people can be informed that there's there's something going on, the better. Also, I think over in um, Anglesey, they're very good. They've got a lot of volunteers on the island who have got uh, cameras and uh, trained on squirrel feeders. And if there's any squirrels that look like they've got something wrong with them, you know, if it's like pox like mm -hmm. lesions, you know, they can send that in. And usually somebody, one of the experts, will get back and say, oh, yeah, actually, it could be pox or it could be something else, could be a bacterial infection. And they're pretty good at finding out uh, which, which one it is just from photographs, really. So, yeah. Yeah, that early reporting is so vital so that a rapid response can be mounted. Um, definitely. Mm -hmm. Steve, did it's you want to add anything on that? interesting to see where yeah. I mean, Peter Muldoon's comment a moment ago about the um, performance the rates, there does seem to be this kind of um, oscillation of the disease outbreaks in form being it, you know, at some point we just all got our fingers crossed that at some point rates are going to develop resistance. But I don't think anybody's been able to demonstrate that yet. But, you know, ho hopefully that's going to happen sooner or later. But it just may take a lot of time. Hopefully the population isn't wiped out before that happens. But um, in the and meantime, we get on top of the grey squirrel problem. Do everything we can to prevent transmission. And that's yeah. about all we can do. That's great. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, that's all the questions that came in. It, does anybody want to just round up and say anything finally, any of our speakers, before we go? Um, oh, somebody just mentioned Tim Rowland just asked gene editing in grace to increase male offspring a solution. Um, it's certainly something that's being looked at and uh, there's uh, research being done on it at the moment. It looks like it's quite far away uh, if it was a reality, but it's definitely something that um, gene editing, as with any solution, any potential solution is something that the Accord and everybody in the Red School conservation world is looking at. Um, for the future. I don't know whether anybody else wants to talk about gene editing quickly or... No, I think we, at the moment we just, it's a potential, but we just don't know enough uh, as if, if it could be effective, but definitely, definitely that and anything else on, on the horizon we'll, we'll keep a lookout for. I think it does raise some interesting ethical questions that haven't been bottomed out yet, but um, yeah, you know, as a, as a technology, it's interesting, but a very long way away yet. Yeah, and I think until we can see whether it would be effective or not, we can't make we couldn't make a decision anyway. Can I can I make a final comment? Yeah, just wanted to reiterate the massive thanks to all the volunteers and people working on red squirrel conservation in England. I can't speak for the UK, obviously that's a devolved thing, but um, in England, they, you know, people do a brilliant job. Thank you so much, and uh, keep up the brilliant work. Thanks, Steve.
Did anybody yeah, I would to... reiterate that last that last comment. A big thank you to, to all the volunteers. I'm not sure if there's anyone uh, joining in on this from from Wales, but uh, regardless, just just thanks to everybody because uh, the squirrels can't be won't be there without you and all your help. So yeah, yeah, same from Northern Ireland. Thank you. <laughs> The same from Scotland as well. Eternally grateful for our volunteers. Yeah, it, it's wonderful the the effort that goes into saving our red squirrels. We wouldn't, we, we definitely wouldn't have many of them left, I think, if it wasn't for for the all the wonderful volunteers. But. Um, well, I just want to finish up by saying a massive thank you to all of our speakers for this Red Squirrel Conservation Update for Red Squirrel Awareness Week. It's been uh, great to see, absolutely fantastic, just to see all of the work that's going on in the in the different countries, devolved or otherwise. Um, but hopefully we can have a, you know, by bringing us all together, it is actually a coordinated and collaborative uh, response to Red Squirrel Conservation and Grey Squirrel Management. But um, brilliant. Um, I will put a recording of this up on our uh, UK Squirrel Accord YouTube channel um, today or, or tomorrow. But if you want to get involved in tomorrow's uh, conference, uh, the rest of tomorrow's conference, then uh, please do join us. Um, but just, yeah, a final thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you to you all for joining us and uh, enjoy the rest of Red Squirrel Awareness Week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kay. Thank Bye. Thanks, Kay. Bye. 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 Bye.